Um, I'm happy to introduce you to Professor Philip Russell. He's a director at the Max Planck Institute uh, for the Science of Life in Erlangen, Germany. Uh, Phil has a, and, a, and, a, and holds a group chair in experimental physics at the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg. It's hard to give an introduction for Phil because he has such an extensive uh, CV. Uh, I'd like to highlight a few points. He has over uh, 600 publications. He's co-inventor on 37 um, disclosures or patents covering many aspects of, of, of photonics and optics. He received uh, numerous awards, including the prestigious uh, from Halford uh, Award and uh, Robert Burley Prize. Uh, he has been a director at large uh, at the Optical Society of America, a president, uh, of the Optical Society of America during 2013, last year, 14. Yeah. 15, yeah. Uh, and uh, I met Philip in one of these events. Uh, we were capturing the lunch. It was about 13 years ago, I think. Uh, I was sitting in one of his um, chairs there, and I still remember one of his lies. <laughs> he... I, I don't tell him. I, I put it in for your benefit. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you can tell me later which one it is. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll not say then. Okay, right. right. But yeah, um, we are very um, thankful that Philip could uh, attend this event, and uh, I hope you guys enjoy as much as we did 13 years ago with some new stuff that uh, we've been doing at Max Point. Thanks, okay, Phil. Okay, thank you, Gustavo. Yeah, yeah, what a wonderful lot of students. Great, great audience. And I recognize one or two faces who are going to hear some of this stuff twice. <laughs> With a bit more detail this time, though, because um, I gave a lecture two days ago, was it? Yesterday? I don't know. Yes, it was yesterday, gosh. <laughs> Feels like a long time ago. Anyway. Um, so where to start? Well, I'm going to start with uh, something, something that's nothing to do with science. And you, maybe you've been wondering what on earth it is. Um, this is the skyline of Erlangen. It's not the most beautiful skyline in the world. But it does have some nice churches, and the moon's not usually that big. Uh, this actually is a... Is a a smokestack for it supplies the town hall with heating. You know, so we have it's, it, it's much taller than anything else on the skyline. And over here is a Ferris wheel. You know what that is? You ride on it in a fair. You ride, it doesn't go very fast. Well, this is only there during the beer fest, the beer festival. Erlangen, maybe it's not so famous, but it has the second biggest beer festival in Germany. So, <laughs> and it happens in May, not in October. So if you want to come and visit us, that's the time to come. Okay. Um, so I was told to give four lectures, uh, and uh, so I thought I'd choose four topics. And these are the four topics. They're all d about different things, as you can see. Um, but the, con the, the constant theme in, in, in all this work are these photonic crystal fibers, as we call them. Um, and I'm going to tell you all about that. And, in, in a moment. Um, so the topics are the basics, and then I'm going to talk about twisted PCFs. These are, these are um, chiral structures and the effect that they have on light, and in particular the effect they have on angular momentum. Then I'm going to talk about some work on gas-based nonlinear optics PCF. This, this is one of the most exciting areas, I think, in recent years that's emerged from this technology. And finally, I'm going to talk a bit about optomechanics, where light is able to push around small mechanical objects they start to move and they act back on the light and you get all sorts of wonderful stuff happening. Actually, the experts are sitting in the audience, people like Gustavo. Particularly, this is his, uh, his particular expertise. Okay, so let's start. Basics of photonic crystal fibers. Um, there's some pretty pictures for you. Uh, these are optical fibers. They look like normal optical fibers, except when you look at them in a microscope and you see this, there's an array of hollow channels. Usually, usually they're hollow channels. But the, they can sometimes be just strands of a different glass, for example. So it might be an all-solid glass structure with different glasses in, the, in, the, in these, these holes and compared to the rest. Um, but the common feature is that there's some sort of periodicity involved. That's why we call it a photonic crystal. Crystals are periodic structures. Um, in this case, the periodic structures are wavelength scale or, or even bigger than wavelength scale. They come in all kinds of varieties, solid core, hollow core, and you get beautiful pictures out of this work. You can generate fantastic colors of light, broadband white light, very bright light, ultraviolet light. You get some beautiful patterns uh, that for some of the modes that are guided in some of these cores. These are pictures of modes that we've taken. And uh, just, just so in case you're wondering what this is, this is actually, as far as I'm concerned, 
uh, this is the 25th, this year is the 25th anniversary of, of these fibers because um, this is when I first had the idea of, of trying to make a fiber that had some kind of periodic transverse structure like this two-dimensional photonic crystal structure. Um, and it was at, at a meeting at Clio in 1991. Um, this is the big laser and electrolytics conference. And I was able to even work out when exactly it was on the day. So this was a meeting of, this was a talk at Quells about liquid droplets, making lasers out of them, I think. And this was a talk at Clio about some nonlinear material. And in between, I got bored and started scribbling, <laughs> as you do, you know. So, and I was, I was just fascinated by the idea of a photonic band gap you know, back then. It was a new thing. And uh, I knew about optical fibers, so I was wondering, maybe, maybe you could make a fiber like this, and it could have a hollow core, and you could, you could guide light in vacuum. Uh, uh, all kinds of things seemed possible. Some other rather funny comments here. Call Peter Knight. I don't know if you have anyone know Peter Knight. Somebody must know Peter Knight. I know Roy does. You do. Okay. He's he's quite a famous guy in in the UK science scene. I don't know why I was going to call him, but um, anyway, there's the note. <laughs> so that's how this this started, at least for me. I mean, if I hadn't had this idea back then, I'd probably somebody else had it at the same time. I don't know. Uh, but sooner or later, somebody would have thought of doing this. I think. So let's talk about some basics of these, these fibers. Um, there are two, two main types of photonic crystal fiber. The first kind is the easier one to understand, and this is the one that guides by total internal reflection. And typically, this is a solid core fiber. It's always a solid core fiber, actually. It could be a liquid core fiber in some cases, but uh, most of the time, it's solid glass. So let's think about it. So let's, uh, let's think about um, solving Maxwell's equations for a structure like this. This is the transverse microstructure of a PCF. It doesn't have any cores, you can see. It's just a whole lot of hollow channels arranged in a hexagonal lattice. And back in the early 90s, this, this is 1995, this is, this is published before we made the first fiber, in fact. It was a theoretical study of whether or not a structure like this could support a photonic band gap. It was interestingly, back then, if you read the literature, Everyone said you couldn't get a photonic band gap if the index contrast between the hollow channels and the glass was, was, uh, was as small as this. It had to be something like 1 to 2.1 1 to or something like that. But of course, those calculations were for calculations in plane, where the light is, is traveling just in the transverse plane, with, and there isn't any propagation constant along the axis. So beta is 0 in that case. All the propagation is transverse. Under those circumstances, um, you need a, a larger index contrast than this. But and actually, because I'd worked on periodic structures and understood them reasonably well, I realized that, that if, you could, if you could take the wave momentum of light, beta, or just k, the k times the refractive index, that's a big, it's a, big a lot of momentum. And if you could, you could have most of that pointing along the axis of the fiber and just a little bit pointing transverse to the axis, then, then the amount of momentum that you had to trap was much smaller, so it should be easier to get a photonic band gap. It's a very simple kind of explanation. It's a, it's a little bit, another analogy I've used is if you're driving along a highway, well, let's, let's think about Germany where you can drive as fast as you like sometimes. You're driving enormously fast along a highway and everyone's driving at this huge speed. It sounds very dangerous, but of course everyone's going in the same direction, at least you hope they are. <laughs> And, 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 and it, it just takes a little, just a tiny little bit of, you know, you, you, you kind of trap, the cars are trapped on this highway. Um, they're going extremely fast in that direction. The amount of momentum transverse is under normal circumstances very small, so it's, it's pretty safe. So it's a similar kind of thing we're doing with light. It has an enormous amount of momentum along the axis, and we just have to trap a small amount to keep the light, keep the light guided. So let's think about this. So this is silica and air. It's 45% air by, by area in the structure. And uh, we did the calculations. And actually, this was a good time to be doing these calculations, and the whole lot of things came together. If we tried to do these calculations in the 1980s, let's say, the computers couldn't have done it. They weren't, the computers weren't good enough. They weren't fast enough. All, all we had back then were PCXTs. Probably none of you have ever seen one of those. That was my first computer that I actually bought for some huge amount of money, a uh, ridiculous amount of money. I think it cost me $3,000 back then. Now you can get them for probably, I don't know, $100 or something. 
which is and much more powerful. But, but anyway, the, the, so the, you needed a computer to calculate the band structure of this. There wasn't any easy way to do this analytically. So you really needed to do finite element modeling or plane wave expansions or something like that. So we did this, and we then plotted the results in, in this way. So this is the wave vector component along the axis, beta. Um, I've been talking about that. It's multiplied by lambda, which is the spacing between the holes. So that's the period of the periodic structure. And here's the frequency, uh, normalized frequency, the vacuum. It's the frequency divided by C. It's the vacuum wave vector times, times, the, times the, the pitch, but the distance between the holes. So these are normalized parameters. And we think about this. Let's think about what happens in the, in the hollow channels. Well, we know the refractive index in the hollow channels is, is 1. So the maximum refractive index the light can have in those hollow channels is 1, which means that beta, the maximum value beta can have in the hollow channels is equal to omega lambda over C. So if we have, say, beta lambda is 8, then this, this also has to be 8. Okay. So on the left-hand side of this line, we can have propagation. The, the waves are free to propagate. In, in, but if they, if they try to get a momentum that's larger than that, they become evanescent. So we're evanescent on the right, propagating on the left. That's the vacuum. Then we can think on this diagram about the glass. Well, of course, the silica glass has a higher refractive index. It's about 1.46, 1.45, depends on the wavelength that you're operating at. Um, we can say exactly the same thing for the silica, that if we're in the silica, the bits of the glass regions of this structure, then we choose a frequency of light, let's say 7 in normalized units, then the maximum index we can get is 1.46 times. The maximum value beta lambda is 1.46 times 7, which takes you out, out here somewhere. So once again, on the left-hand side of this, anywhere in this region, the light is free to propagate in the glass. And on the right-hand side, it's cut off. It can't propagate. This is all very simple stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, so if, if light, say, comes from let's say, say it comes from the glass and it propagates towards the hollow channels at a fixed value of beta, um, then, then we'll find that, that we can get total internal reflection. If, if the wave vector for a particular frequency is, is say, let's choose 8 and, and we propagate, propagate um, towards the boundary, we'll find that the light is, is evanescent in vacuum if we use, say, this point because we're on the right-hand side of this line, so it gets totally internally reflected by the by the hollow channels. Okay, so that's, that's the simple stuff. Now, now the question is, what, 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 what is this, what's, the, what's the curve for the composite structure? This is a mixture. It's an ordered mixture of glass and air. And not surprisingly, you probably, it's not surprising perhaps, so it's pretty obvious that somehow or other this has to lie, the, the, the maximum index you can get in this composite structure has to lie somewhere in between. Let me get rid of that, that mouse arrow. I don't know what it's doing there. <clears throat> Um, and that's indeed what you see. So the, you do the calculations. This is where you need Maxwell's equations. We find that the maximum index that you can sustain in this photonic crystal fiber cladding lies in between that of vacuum and silica. Not surprising, it should lie in between. Um, um, it's, it's, uh, this, this is the result of calculations. Um, and in fact, if you look at the dispersion of this, of this line, it doesn't go through, through zero on this, on this, on this diagram because it does, the refractive index is in fact changing as you change the frequency of the light because of the properties of a period. Periodic structures are highly dispersive. That's to say the refractive index changes with the frequency of the light, and we see that in this case. So this is the maximum index that the crystal fiber cladding can support. What else do we see on this diagram? Well, this is what we were looking for. We were hoping to see photonic band gaps. These are uh, ranges of frequency and wave vector. If you choose the right ranges of these two things, we can find regions on this diagram where the light is unable to exist. There are no photonic states. It, it's cut off. It's evanescent. There aren't any modes um, in, in, these, in these regions. Um, and we were very happy to see that these, these photonic band gaps extended into the, into the region where light is free to propagate in vacuum. Because then we have a magic situation where the light can propagate in a hollow core, but it can't propagate in the cladding because it gets reflected by the photonic band gap. Okay, let's just, uh, so that's, that's the whole diagram. Let's go back to this simpler diagram where we just have the PCF cladding. Let's think about modified total internal reflection guidance. Well, in this case, um, we're going to create a solid core. So there's the solid core. I've lost one of the hollow channels. 
And uh, we now have a situation where the light in the core is, is in glass. So the index in the core is the index of silica. The index in the cladding, which is this composite structure, is on this white line. And we can get guided modes provided we sit at, at a value of beta that lies between these two, these two lines, somewhere in between these two lines. Um, and um, the actual position of this dot depends on the design of the structure. It depends on how big the holes are and basically the geometry <coughs> of the structure. So this is, this is guidance by total internal reflection. So the light is free to propagate in the, in the glass, but it's cut off in the photonic crystal fiber cladding because the red dot is on the right-hand side of this PCF cladding line. Okay, so there's a picture of one of these uh, fibers uh, conceptually. Um, this is how it might look uh, if it worked. So the refractive index in the core on average is higher than the refractive index in the cladding. And another way of looking at this, not using that diagram. So you can easily find a situation where a total internal reflection will guide light in, in, the, in the solid core. Of course, I call it modified total internal reflection. Modified. Because it's not straightforward total internal reflection. You can see that right away because the core boundary is not continuous. You have a strong barrier, an escape route, where light can just escape, you would think. If this was water in a pipe, it would just squirt out of the, in between the, in between the, hollow, in between the hollow channels. So it's a discontinuous boundary the core has. Um, and that, that's, uh, you might think, oh, well, so what? It doesn't really, what does that do for you? Well, actually, it's quite magic what it does for you. What it, what it does for you, if you get the design correct, that's to say the size of the, the diameter of these hollow channels compared to the spacing between them, if you get that right, geometrically speaking, you can, you can arrange things so that all the higher order modes that might exist in the core leak away. Um, and the reason for that is the, that the, what I call the transverse effective wavelength of the light. I talked about the, most of the momentum of the, of the light being along the axis and a little bit being transverse. Yeah? that little bit of transverse momentum can be translated into an effective wavelength. And that effective wavelength for the fundamental mode is quite long. So the fundamental mode is myopic or, or something. It, it can't see stuff. That it, just, it, can't, it can't actually see the escape route. It's unable to squeeze between these, these, these hollow channels and escape, whereas the higher order modes can because they have a, a smaller transverse effective Wavelength, and actually one of the problems I wanted to set you was to just to calculate the transverse effective wavelength as a function of um, propagation constant along the along the axis in the glass and in the hollow channels. Sort of simple problem, just to make sure you understand that. Okay, so we can filter out the higher order modes. Let's just look at some of the very first results. This is the very first photonic crystal fiber that was ever made by Jonathan Knight, who was a postdoc of mine back then. In 1996, we published it, but it, we got the result in 95. Um, <clears throat> that's, the, that's the fiber, made with great pain. <laughs> it took a long, long time to, I'll tell you how we make them in, in, in a moment, but uh, it took quite a long time. It took three years to work out how to do this. Um, and you can see the hollow channels, these black dots, and here's the, here's the core, and here's the cladding. Um, and uh, one thing we discovered, experimentally, first of all, was that this core never seemed to guide any higher order modes, exactly as I just explained, um, that the higher order modes are not guided, they leak away, whereas the fundamental mode is trapped. At that time, we were at the University of Southampton, which has this big uh, optoelectronics research center, though back then it was in the early days, but still they had dozens of different lasers and different wavelengths. And so Jonathan Knight went around every possible laser in the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, center trying to find a wavelength where you could see some higher order modes, and he couldn't. It was independent of wavelength. Um, so this, we call this endlessly single mode fiber. And I think that's now the high, most highly cited paper in the, in the, in the field, um, uh, last time I checked. This was Tim Burks's idea to call it endlessly single mode. Actually, he's another postdoc. He was the first person to work on this, actually, as a postdoc. <clears throat> So anyway, this is just another picture of the, same, of the same thing. Here's the fundamental mode, nicely trapped between these, these, uh, these hollow channels. Um, the, if you, another way of looking at this is that the photonic crystal, the unit cell of the photonic crystal is anti-resonant with the light in the core, so they can't talk to each other. They're propagating at different phase velocities along the axis, so, so they're just phase match, they can't talk to each other. Another way to look at it is this fundamental mode is unable to squeeze between 
the gaps. And if you want to keep a sheep in a field and you have a fence, you've got to make sure the fence posts are close enough so the sheep can't get between them. It's the same kind of idea. Whereas the high rotor modes, as I said before, they have a smaller transective wavelength and they're able to escape. So, so we can make an endlessly single mode fiber. This is actually a very nice fiber for all kinds of experiments where you want to preserve, you want to preserve the spatial coherence of the light. Um, so you can deliver light 20, 30, 100 meters away and it ends up in this beautiful mode that you can focus down to a very tiny spot. So it's, it's a very nice uh, system. And it works at any wavelength where the, where the glass actually transmits light. So we're kind of keeping light behind bars. These are the hollow channels. The reason this guy can't escape is that he's not resonant with these bars because they're barriers, nor is he resonant with the windows in between. So he's basically stuffed. He can't escape. Does Gustavo recognize that? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Sorry? There was a change. I'm not going to say what it was there. OK, so the other kind of fiber is the photonic band gap um, uh, fiber. I, I did say that the total internal reflection is a solid core, or it could be a liquid core, depending on the design. But it's, it would never actually be a core that is, um, that is just vacuum, I mean, not, not, nor, not at normal frequencies, at least. <clears throat> so the other type of guidance is photonic band gap guidance. So we come back to our diagram here, and I put back these photonic band gap fingers that are pointing down from the top the top right. Um, and uh, here you can get photonic band gap guidance by two-dimensional photonic band gap. For example, inside this finger coming down, it could be at, at this point. And in this case, we have a situation where the, um, where the light is, is able to, is, 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 is within, in the photonic crystal fiber cladding, the light is, is, um, is able to propagate. Whereas, whereas, yeah, this, this picture isn't quite correct, I realize. But you, you can actually get guidance at a point like this if you make a defect in the center of the structure, which allows there to be a photonic state there, um, but it finds itself um, uh, in, in a photonic band gap when it, when it tries to escape from it. Um, it's a slightly more, it's not such an interesting situation, this. Much more interesting is when we, we actually make a hollow core and we're at a point like this, where the light is free to propagate in vacuum. So it can propagate in the core and form a, a mode. You have to, to create a mode, you have to have propagating light. Uh, but if it tries to escape into the cladding, it it's comes up against the photonic band gap. So you can trap the light in, in the hollow core. <clears throat> yeah, I should, yeah, OK. So this is, this is the most important one, the one I, one I want, to, want you to think about. So there's a picture of it. Uh, we have the hollow core. We have this uh, photonic crystal, which has to be carefully designed because you want to get a, a photonic band gap there. That, that's not so easy. But clearly, the, the refractive index in the core is less than the refractive index in the cladding, on, on average at least. So total internal reflection will not work here. So you, you absolutely need some new mechanism, which is the two-dimensional photonic band gap. Um, and actually, in recent years, and I'm going to talk about this, uh, I think, um, in, in a minute, or maybe, I can't remember, was this lecture or one of the others, but I'm going to talk about something that's sort of in between a full two-dimensional photonic band gap and uh, something that's related to a mechanism called anti-resonant reflection, um, which is a mechanism which, which uh, basically you, you, you make two Fabry-Perot resonators and you have a hollow region in between. And if these two Fabry-Perot resonators are operated off resonance, then they reflect light very strongly. On resonance, they transmit 100% of the light. But off resonance, they, they, um, they reflect very strongly. And so, so but, but not, maybe not completely, but they reflect quite a lot of the light. And, uh, and so it turns out you can do this in two dimensions as well to using this anti-resonant reflection effect. And it has some advantages. Um, but you get the, the loss is somewhat higher quite a lot higher with this mechanism compared to the full two-dimensional photonic band gap. So let's have a look at the very first fiber that, that we made. And this was at the University of Bath in 1998, I think. Uh, it was, I can still remember, it's one of those things you never forget. Um, you've been, uh, we, I've been plan trying to make a fiber that did this for about, let's see, it would have been seven years or something like that. 
And we discovered all kinds of interesting things along the way. But I, at some point, I was thinking we're never going to see guidance in a hollow core with this, this photonic band gap effect. It's just too difficult. Then one afternoon, we managed to do it. And the, the excitement was just amazing in the lab, you know, people looking in the microscope. Very simple experiment. Short length of the fiber we'd just drawn. Look in, put some white light down below, focus it in, and look what's coming out of the top. And uh, this is what we saw, one of, one of the pictures. Uh, you can see the photonic crystal uh, cladding with the photonic band gap, and this sort of greenish yellow light trapped in the hollow core. Almost looks like it's floating and not touching anything around the edge, just floating there in space. Um, <laughs> it looks pretty weird. Um, that was, and then we published that in 99, uh, the first demonstration that this actually worked. And back in 99, there was still a lot of excitement about photonic band gaps and photonic crystals. And, and you know the journalists, they're always looking for something to write about, scientific journalists. I don't know if any of you, any of you have had to um, talk to those guys. Uh, it's well worth talking to them because uh, you, you get, some, get some glory from it. And maybe somebody who knows nothing about science actually has heard of your work. Anyway, the, the, the Economist magazine talked to us and talked to various other people working on photonic crystals, and they called the article New Age Crystals. I don't know what you, New Age Crystals, you know, these things that have magic properties. <laughs> you know, they can make you feel cool or relaxed, <laughs> happy, I don't know. So this, they thought this was a funny title, and I think they talked to Eli Yablonovich, who's one of the inventors of the photonic band gap, because this looks a bit like him. <laughs> and these squiggly things, these are photons flying off in all directions. And these are guides, and he's called a guide, G-I-D, it says guide. And these guys, because photons are very fast, you've got to have a few people to help. You know, so, um, so they're there as well. So uh, I never actually asked him if this is in, indeed a cartoon of him. I haven't dared actually ask him. <laughs> He's a good friend of mine, by the way. Maybe I should ask him. So, <laughs> so anyway, that's what happens when you, when you, you talk to scientific journalists. <laughs> OK, let, let's just, just compare now. What I'd like to do, I've talked about photonic crystal fibers, and maybe some of you don't work with optical fibers. The very simple single mode fiber that is used in all telecommunications, fantastic engineering miracle, actually, really amazing. Um, Thing, but it's very, very simple, like a lot of the best things are very simple. So th this, this has a doped glass core, which is incredibly pure. It's made, made using a chemical process. And it has a silica setting, but the silica is also very pure. And if we look at our diagram for this, this, this fiber, well, we've got, two, we've got two materials, quite simple. We've got, uh, we've got uh, the silica, which we had before, the green line index of 1.46 or something, and then we have the germanium dope core, which has an index that's just less than a percent higher, typically, than the index of the silica, so it's sitting on that, on that blue line. And this little white strip on this huge diagram, this, all this, this huge area, it's just like this little white strip that, uh, that all of telecommunications operates in. No, it's very restricted, which is why I call it a straitjacket. If you're, if you're not a telecoms engineer, but, uh, but someone who likes doing, playing around, uh, making light interact with materials, you're very restricted here. You know, you can do a certain amount, but after a while, you go away and do something else. Um, so it felt, actually, to me, I have to be honest, I, I did actually feel a bit like this with single I'd been trying to do interesting things with them. And, do some in, nice, sort of intriguing new experiments and so on. But, but it, after a while, you run out of ideas. Um, uh, so, so it's very restricted. If you compare that with PCF, I call it the PCF playground. Now we can play anywhere on this diagram. We can, we can guide light. We can control the interaction of light and materials and gases and any kind of glass or liquid. You can do all sorts of things with the, this, this PCF idea because, because we can do so much um, on this diagram for different values of, of wave vector and operate in the vacuum region, you can do so many things. So it really is a playground. Maybe it's a good moment since it's the 25th anniversary just to, to uh, acknowledge some of the original guys. These are the two key players, Tim Burks, my first postdoc, who joined it and confessed to me that he'd never believed it would work. But he started working on it anyway. 
And then Jonathan Knight came along. He was a bit more enthusiastic and built on the work that Tim Burks did. And the two of them together made the very first fiber in 90, 1995. And this is the team at the University of Bath, who many of whom actually made some of, a lot of the initial breakthroughs in, in, in the field. I've got all their names here. Some of you may have heard of Feder Ben Abid. There he is. He's a professor in France. William Wadsworth is a professor at Bath. Burks and Knight are both professors at the University of Bath. Sergio is, is now in Sydney. Who else might you know? Oh, Alex Argiras. He's, some of you are from Sydney, no? You must know Alex. Some of you are from Sydney, no? Is that right? Yeah. You are, OK. So you probably know Alex, yeah. Uh, yeah, anyway. Oh, yeah, Phil Light. He's in Adelaide, actually. Uh, he's back in. He's, he's at Harriet Watt University. Nicola Jolly is a professor with me at the moment. So it's been it's been a nice feel for all these guys. They've had they've been they've had nice careers out of it so far at least. Okay, so how do we make them? Um, yeah, got a question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, didn't work. Vance Griabin. This is Alex. Oh, this chap is blocked out. That's a very good question. <laughs> Now, why would I block them out? <laughs> oh, I can go one back. Yeah, that's true. Oh, oh this, is, this is, yeah, that's, um, that's he's a Greek, a Greek guy. He didn't spend all that long in the group. Uh, what was his name? Um. <laughs> Greg. Greg, of course. You, you do this, yes. Antonopoulos, Greg Antonopoulos. Yeah, he's in Athens um, these days. Yeah, but, you know, I didn't block him out. I, I was thinking, my God, what have I done? <laughs> And Fung Luan's back in China. He's a professor there. Anyway, it's fun. It's been a lot of fun, all the wonderful people I've worked with over the years. So how do we make them? And of course, this, this, is, this was the, most of our work during the first three or three years, three, four years of, of working on this was, was trying to find a way of making these fibers. Because most people I spoke to at the beginning who were fiber fabricators said, looked at me and I sort of said, uh, you should you just forget it, you know, do something useful. Uh, but, but yeah, in the end, we find a way of doing it. And it's built on the fact, of course, the glass, if you, if you heat it up, doesn't just suddenly melt like water. It slowly melts. It slowly turns to syrup as you increase the temperature. And this makes it possible just by controlling temperature to control the viscosity and therefore, therefore have a really good control over the structure that you, you want to, main, to maintain. And here we are. This is how we now do it. I mean, there, we do have some other techniques but this is the main technique we use. We start with capillaries, which are about one or two millimeters in diameter. And these are capillaries of silica glass. They're stacked very carefully into a hexagonal array. There's a core in the middle there, which is a solid glass rod. This is done in a high-class clean room. It usually takes, well, it depends how skilled you are, but it usually takes one or two hours to make a stack. It's very, very easy to have structural defects. and you charging, you know, the things charge up and they, 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 they move around in weird ways when there's charge. So you, there's all kinds of challenges there. I actually think we, we need to develop a robot to do this. Just remove the, the people from it and get a robot to do it would probably be easier. So if anyone wants to design a robot for stacking, let me know. <laughs> I could have a job for you. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> And I don't mean you, I mean a robot, yeah. <laughs> OK, so, so once we've got this thing, we then put it in, we put this stack inside a tube. So this, uh, we take a tube, a large tube, and we put the stack inside. It's tied with wire to keep it together. And then we put it in a fiber drawing tower with a, a furnace that runs at nearly 2,000 degrees. So, so it's, it's too hot to look, it's too bright to look at. It's so, so hot. And we push the silica in there. Silica melts at around 1,800, between 1,800 and 2,000 or so. So it becomes more and more viscous. And then you wait for the drop off. And in a moment, you'll see that. Here it comes. It drops off through the bottom of the furnace. And it necks down. It becomes narrower. And if you have the conditions right and you control the pressure in these hot channels, you can actually get uh, something that's about two or three millimeters in diameter here, which contains a miniature version of the structure that you very carefully built here. So, so it's a cane. It's quite stiff. That's why we call it a cane. It's like, just like a cane. And uh, you can actually see the holes if you have good eyesight. They aren't, they aren't so small yet that you can't see them. 
Um, <clears throat> so that's the intermediate cane. And then the final step is we take the cane and we put it inside another tube and collapse the tube onto it and draw it down to the optical fiber. Now, this is the initial stage of the drawing of a fiber. We put, we put it off. Um, and after a while, it gets rolled up. Well, it has to go through a coating cup to put plastic on the outside. And it gets rolled up in a drum. And uh, you know, for something that's about this long in the initial stack, we can end up with hundreds of meters of, of fiber. So, and sometimes the, the scale of the structures, as you'll see, the scale of the structures in, in these fibers can be na genuinely nanoscale. You can make a nanoscale thing with nanoscale features. I mean, something a, mic a microstructure with nanoscale, well controlled nanoscale features that's a kilometer long. It's sort of it's a weird combination of dimensions, actually. You, know, you don't often get such huge contrast in, in size in, in, in a structure. Um, and you have lots and lots of it. You can, you can do lots of experiments and break it, throw it away, and get some more. I mean, it's, it's, unless, of course, you have to buy it at, at $1,000 a meter. And there are companies that sell this fiber for that kind of price. So it's best if you make it yourself, much cheaper. OK, just to give you a visualization, this is the initial stack. It's about a centimeter in diameter. The first stage, we, we collapse it down to about a millimeter, a factor of 10. And then afterwards, and this is where the resolution of the projector doesn't work, we get down to the final fiber size. So we can go down by a factor of, of about 100 in, in linear dimensions. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a very nice way of making, making tiny things. And they are pretty tiny. That's a fruit fly holding one of our fibers in an electron microscope. He looks pretty fed up, to be honest. But, but anyway, there's the fiber. There's the hollow core. You can't really see the structure because of the resolution, but never mind. It's, it's, it's small, put it that way. OK, that's how we make it, um, how we make them. And uh, so this, is a, this, is, this lecture is supposed to be about basics. And I thought, well, what's basic? What's the most basic thing about these fibers that's, that's been the, the most, one of the most important things that, that we've been able to do? Well, one of the, the, mo the, the most important thing, the thing that we've been able to do is control the group velocity dispersion in ways that were impossible before with standard fibers. And, and this has opened up so many opportunities. Um, you could spend, I could spend a whole lecture course talking about them, I think. But I wanted to talk about dispersion itself. What is dispersion, first of all? I know you probably all know what it is, but uh, make sure you know what it is. And then talk about dispersion in, in waveguides. <clears throat> um, and make just briefly mention the big success story of this technology, which is supercontinuum generation. And I think Roy, Roy Taylor is going to talk about that in, in more detail, um, I think, is it tomorrow or at some point anyway this week. Forgotten I had some audio here, so uh, there was an audio cable. The audio cable, there it is, right? Yeah. Very good. So you better block your ears. This might be very loud. You ready? Nobody's blocking their ears. Okay. Well, it's not switched on. <laughs> you got to hear this. Worked yesterday. No. Oh, there we are. Has anyone heard these before? Nobody ever heard of them? You have. All right, somebody knows about it. Good. I, I spent um, a long winter's night on a, on a headland in the northeast of Ireland in midwinter with an audio amplifier and a very long aerial trying to hear these things. Because they're audio frequency signals. You can, they, just, just, they just appear from nowhere. You hear this whistling thing going. The high frequencies are arriving first. The low frequencies are arriving later. Um, and it stopped. Here it goes again. All right. And, and what are they? Well, I couldn't hear a thing. All I could, all I could hear was Morse code from shipping. This sort of stuff, you know, on and on and on. Uh, I didn't hear any whistlers, but, but you can hear them if you go to the right place. And well, what happens is lightning strikes up maybe in the northern hemisphere. So that's like a hammer blow, bang, a very short impulse. It has lots of frequencies in it because it's a short pulse. This then excites, this electrical thing excites um, <clears throat> uh, coupled sort of plasma waves 
that, 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 are, that are guided along the geomagnetic field lines of the Earth. They start out as a, as a very short pulse, and as they travel, they get longer, they become chirped, because the high frequencies have a, travel more quickly, and the low frequencies travel more slowly. So the high frequencies arrive first. You're down here in Sydney, you know, listening to, I don't know, some music or something, then this weird whistle appears. If you ever hear that, you'll know it's a whistler. It's unlike you'll ever hear it, actually, but never mind. So, 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 so this, this recording is exactly of, 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 of these waves. And this is an example of, of anomalous dispersion. Waves in, these kind of waves have anomalous dispersion. That's to say the higher frequencies travel more quickly. They have a higher group velocity, that is to say. So let's think about <coughs> chromatic dispersion or group velocity dispersion or whatever you want to call it. Let's think about it in a waveguide. Let's suppose we make a perfect hollow core waveguide. So this material might be a perfect metal that, that reflects light. So you could be thinking about maybe microwaves or something like that, which do guide very well in, in, in hollow waveguides. Anyway, it's a perfectly reflecting material on the outside, and we have a hollow core. There's nothing in the hollow core. And we think about the guided modes of, uh, that, that exist in that hollow core. So uh, you will find, if you do a calculation on this, that the the, the, uh, the higher frequencies travel more quickly. They have, a high, they have a higher group velocity. So if you put a pulse in in the blue, it will arrive at the other end before a pulse that's in the red part of the spectrum because the group velocity is faster. Okay, so this, this is a fundamental property of any hollow, hollow waveguide. It's a purely geometrical effect. Okay? Let's suppose now we, uh, we think about a bulk material. We might be putting this bulk material into the core well, bulk materials, it depends on what the material is, but most materials that are transparent in the visible and the near-infrared, most of them have normal dispersion in that frequency range. This is the response of the material, the electrons in the material responding to the, to the light. So we have, we have uh, normal dispersion there, which is to say that the bluer, the higher frequencies travel more slowly. Now, clearly, we put these together, put some of this material in the, in the hollow core, then the, the dispersion you actually get at the end of the day is the balance between these two, these two, these two effects. And uh, by con so it depends, on the, it depends on the design, you know, how large is the hollow core. If the core is very big, then it's likely the material dispersion will dominate. If the core is very tiny, the core is very tiny, we may find that the geometrical dispersion, anomalous, anomalous geometrical dispersion is so strong that it overcomes the normal dispersion of the material. So we have a whole wide range of things we can do just by designing this correctly. And a lot of what, a lot of the innovations and excitement in this field really stem from this very simple picture. So one example from the early days, this is a paper back in 2000. Um, if we think about silica glass itself, just, just the glass, so just bulk silica glass, and this is dispersion, so this is in units of picosecond per nanometer Kilometer, what does that mean? Well, what does it mean? It means if I have a pulse with um, a bandwidth in nanometers, let's say it has a bandwidth of 10 nanometers or something, and it travels one kilometer, then it will broaden by that number of picoseconds. So it'll start out with some duration, and after traveling one kilometer, it will have broadened by 100 nanometers. Oh no, how does it work? It will have broadened by 100 picoseconds if it's one, nan one nanometer in bandwidth. So that's the meaning of, of, the, of that parameter. It's, it's very simple. So for bulk silicon gas, it has normal dispersion in this, in this wavelength range. It has a zero dispersion point at around 1.3, which is off, off the diagram. If we take this material and we make a PCF, we make a small core, solid core PCF. So this, this is a solid glass core with 800 nanometer diameter. It's a pretty extremely small, it's a really, really small core. And it has lots of air around as well. So the geometrical dispersion will be very strong for this core. It's very small, but it also confines the light very strongly because, because of the big discontinuity and in index between glass and air. So it, it's going to have very strong geometrical, anomalous geometrical dispersion, which overcomes the dispersion of the silica, reverses the sign. It starts out being normal, ends up being anomalous. It's lifted up. It's, it's larger in magnitude than the value down below, the, the positive or the, this value. It actually is large. The magnitude's bigger. It's changed its sign. And we've shifted the zero dispersion point all the way down to the green, 
to 560 nanometers in this case. And there's a little bit of, the core is not perfectly six-fold symmetric, so you get a little bit of biofringence. That's the reason why there are two dots on, on this plot. Okay, so balancing geometrical dispersion and material dispersion, we're able to get vastly different uh, wavelength dependencies of the, of the, of the dispersion on, on wavelength. And just by changing the size of the core and maybe the size of these hollow channels, we can shift the zero dispersion point over any point, place it anywhere, anywhere on this range. It turns out if you want to generate a supercontinuum, and I'm not going to talk about this myself in, in detail today. I, this, Roy will cover this, I'm, I'm sure. I, th I hope he will. I think he's planning to. If you, the best place to pump actually turns out to be somewhere like this. Because what happens if we pump here is we, it's anomalous dispersion. We get solitons. And um, they, they are able, as they, as they propagate, they're able to, 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 to broaden, the spectrum broadens, so they, they, they get a larger spectrum. And then they generate what we call dispersive waves, not only on, on, on the opposite sides of the two zero dispersion points. There's actually a second zero dispersion point out here. And so we generate dispersive waves here and here. And when you add everything up, you end up with this amazingly broad supercontinuum. You start with an invisible pulse um, with a narrow bandwidth, and you end up with a relatively narrow bandwidth, and you end up with a huge supercontinuum. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about that. Except I did want to mention one recent result. If you want to generate extremely broadband light, what, what do you have to do? Well, you have to do what I just said. Actually, this, this is just a picture of one of these supercontinuum sources, which, is, which these are not commercial sources you can buy. Um, this is actually a few years old. This is giving us four and a half milli milliwatts per nanometer, in, in, in the, basically in, in the visible and near infrared. Um, and this, this is unimaginably bright compared to any other kind of white light source, um, lamps or anything you can think of. It's, it's just remarkable. Um, it's, it's like a white light laser. It is a white light laser. And in order to do this, all you have to do is take an edimium, um, to take a, maybe say a fiber laser delivering picosecond pulses, launch in, in this case, launching in about 10 watts of power, which is quite a lot uh, into the fiber, but at one, at one uh, micron wavelength. Uh, you put it into a core, and the PCF core is not even very small in this case, just six micrometers is what you need to get the, get the right kind of dispersion. Um, and of course, this, the PCF also has this wonderful property that it's endlessly single mode. So uh, no matter what, which one of these, of these, these colors you choose, it will come out in a very nice fundamental mode. So you don't have any high road mode disturbance. It's a wonderful source. Uh, yeah, anyway. This is now many, many labs in the, in the world have these, have these sources. But it did have one nice effect back in the early days when we were first working on this. Um, we weren't the first to observe this, by the way. It was a group in the States that, that took a piece of fiber that made, they'd made in, I think it was OFS or one of those companies that keep changing their names went off to, to a laboratory in Cornell, which is run by Alex Gator, who's going to be giving you lectures next week. So you can ask Alex Gator, how did that go? He, did, he, didn't, he wasn't a co-author on the paper, actually, but he, he let them use his laser. So they put the piece of fiber in front of this Thai sapphire laser, and they saw this incredible supercontinuum. And it, it, it created, a, it triggered a revolution. And one of the things it did in particular was, was help Ted Hench and John Hall, these two guys, uh, make make a, an octave uh, make use of an octave spanning frequency comb to to measure frequency to very high accuracy. So so the, this guy here, John Hall, I went to a conference shortly after this result when they'd been using the fiber to generate this this frequency comb, and he he worked in NIST. He he works he, he spent his whole career measuring frequencies very accurately. And they had systems that involved chains of labs with complicated lasers and each all locked to each other in order to measure frequency to one part in 10 to the 15 or something like that. Vastly complicated systems. But Ted Hench had realized a long time ago that if you could make, uh, take a mode-locked laser and, and generate um, a, a femtosecond frequency comb, which had at least an octave difference in frequency, so a factor of two from here to the other, to the other end, you could use this to, to replace this enormously complicated system with a very simple tabletop setup. Um, and it worked, it turned out. PCF made this, made this possible, and they won a Nobel Prize as a result. 
which is nice. Roy Glauber got the biggest bit, though, because he worked out all the quantum optics a long, long time ago. And these two guys came a bit later, but still. That's a nice part of the story. OK, so looking at time here, this is just one last thing uh, for continuum generation in silica fibers, the silica glass. Of course, uh, silica glass is a material. It has limitations. Um, and one of those limitations is that it, it, it's, it, it's, its window of transparency is somewhat limited. It's not very good at transmitting in the ultraviolet. And uh, certainly, it starts to, to cut off in the infrared beyond maybe two microns or, or so. It starts to go black. You know, so It starts to absorb. So it doesn't have a, all that wide a window. And then recently, we got interested in trying to make PCF using fluorozirconate glass. This is fluorozirconate. It's a combination of all sorts of things. It doesn't have any oxygen in it. Um, but it turns out to have an, an enormously broad transmission window. This material transmits light with low, low loss from 200 nanometers to about 6 micron wavelengths. So I think it's got the biggest transmission window of any material um, that you can find. Um, so from that point of view, it's, it's, it's very interesting to use uh, to, replace, to replace silica. But if you talk to anyone a few years ago about making PCF with this glass, all kinds of problems would be, would be raised. I mean, one, one major problem is that it's very short. You have long and short glasses, if you didn't know that. A long glass is something that, that as you change the temperature, it, it's, it, it becomes, its viscosity changes very slowly over a, over a long temperature range. A short glass is, is a glass that melts quite quickly. Not, not, not instantaneously, but, but, but over, over a narrow range. And Z-Blan, as we call it, Z-Blan glass. Z-Blan, yeah, Z the Americans call it Z-Blan. I should call it Z-Blan, but it's easier, it's easier to say Z-Blan. It melts over about 10 degrees range instead of 200. So this is a challenge. It also has a tendency to crystallize. And that's the last thing you want if you're making a fiber, because the crystallites scatter light strongly. And it tends to be, it, it, it gets attacked by water vapor as well, all kinds of problems. Nevertheless, nevertheless, it turns out to be possible to draw very high quality photonic crystal fiber with this material. If you have the right team and the right people and they, they really concentrate on, on making this work. And this was done by Jin Jiang, who's, um, who's the head of the, one of the people who, who lead the fiber drawing facility at the Institute. And he made this beautiful structure out of this, this difficult glass. And some of the features in here are nanoscale, they're less than a micron in size. So once, once you've got a structure like this, well, you think you have, we're thinking about doing a supercontinuum generation. Wouldn't it be nice if we could generate supercontinuum light down to 200 nanometers and maybe out to 6 microns too? Given the transparency, it might be possible. But you need to think about dispersion. The material itself has a zero dispersion point here, just around to 1.5 microns. It's hard to see. Maybe it's just above 1.5 microns. I think it's 1.6. Oh, 1.62. There you are. So that's the, the dispersion of the glass. And if you look at the core of this structure, um, I don't have the dimensions of the core. But anyway, the core of the structure is small enough so we can shift the zero down, down to here. We get, we, we, we get the two polarizations. It's slightly birefringent, so you have two values of dispersion. And these are some measurements that agree that compared to modeling of the structure. But we can also look at one of these interstitial connections. So these also are miniature waveguides, and they're nanoscale in size. So they have even stronger geometrical dispersion than the core, which then which allows us to shift the curve even further up. So we get this blue curve. So just so and we have lots and lots of these cores. And this is rather nice. We have one fiber, but we have a multitude of different cores, all of them with different dispersion. So just by hunting around with the microscope stage, moving it around and putting light into different, different, uh, different uh, of, these, uh, of these cores, we were able to find one which had this kind of dispersion. And we were pumping at a laser which had a, a wavelength of 1042 uh, nanometers in this case, uh, which was sitting right at the kind of point where you want to sit if you're generate, super, generating a supercontinuum. So the laser itself, there you have these pulses we put in. We're in 140 femtoseconds, 75 megahertz repetition rate. We're pumping in a interstitial junction, one of these things. And this is what we saw. Really stunning in the lab. Um, the, the astonishing thing about this picture, and the picture doesn't do it justice, actually, is just how blue it is. 
it's, it's got this very intense blue structure. The typical supercontinuum for fibers doesn't have a very strong blue component because, the, 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 because of this um, the silica, <coughs> well, basically because of the silica glass, it, it doesn't operate so well when you get to, to, get to high frequencies. But the Zeeblind glass transmits so well in the ultraviolet that you're not just seeing blue light, but you're also seeing lots of ultraviolet light in this case. And if you look at the spectrum coming out of this system, um, just four centimeters of, of, the, of the PCF is, is here, putting the pulses in from the laser and just looking to spectrum analyze it to measure things. But just the photograph of the setup is, is dramatic. We get a bright, stable spectrum that goes all the way down to 200 nanometers wavelength, and it is actually stable. Um, here's a picture of it. I can see this was a conference uh, slide that I used at a conference, so you've got to go to rooms 5, D, and E on Thursday at 14.30, okay? Make a note of that. <laughs> Don't know where they are. Anyway, never mind. So, so we got this, this dramatic supercontinuum from this, this, uh, this, this fiber, which extended in this particular case from 400 nanometers out to about 2.4 microns, and, and, and quite flat, just 10 dB kind of 10 dB uh, range. Over that, over that range. And using a, a slightly different core, we find we could generate light right down to 200 nanometers wavelength. And we saw these very bright peaks. This is a linear scale. And this, this is in, in incredibly bright. There's a picture of it on, I just put cast onto some paper. You, you, you see the fluorescence caused by the ultraviolet light. Um, this, this, uh, this part of the spectrum is very surprising because it was long-term stable. There was no sign of any damage trouble with these wavelengths is that they create color centers. You know, if you take silica glass and, and you, you, you put the, these wavelengths and this, this level of brightness into silica glass, it will darken within sometimes just a few minutes or certainly within hours. So um, you cannot use silica glass down here because of optical damage, basically. In fact, optical damage limits the ultraviolet edge of silica PCF to about 380 nanometers. For a commercial system, if you want to sell something to someone and you want it to work, all the time, and this is, the, this is more or less the limit, maybe 350, but it's, it's round about there. But this, this, this material is extraordinary because it's long-term stable. We, we convert to about 10% of the energy going in into this range, 200 to 400 nanometers, uh, and it's, it's really very, very bright. And it's a bit of a mystery. We don't really quite understand why it's so stable. We're operating close to the band edge of this material. If you operate close to the band edge of a material, then you're quite likely to be breaking bonds and causing trouble in the material. But somehow this Zeeblan material doesn't mind. I, I honestly don't know what's going on. I think it may be self-healing. Maybe we do, we do create color centers, but they're very short-lived. They're very shallow. So they disappear just through thermal vibrations. I don't know. But that's something we're looking into at the moment. But, but the, the result itself is very exciting. OK, I need to acknowledge these guys at some point. Uh, so here's a picture of the group uh, just about a month ago, I think. Um, I put this up just yesterday, too. I'm going to point it out again. We would like to have more women in the group. We've only got one at the moment. These are all male, these other people. I used to have lots. It used to be much better, actually, but I don't know what's happened. We're not getting any applica applications from women. And this is taken in the, in the fiber drawing clean room uh, of our old building, because we're moving to a new building. We're getting a brand new clean room, much bigger. Um, and so we thought it'd be nice to take a picture of the group in the clean room when all the equipment had been removed. So there they are. You need to have a staircase. These fiber drawing towers are maybe nine, ten meters high, and they've got several stages where you do different things. You need to be able to run up and down all the time. Uh, anyway. Okay, what have I done? I've taken, I've taken a whole hour there, I think. So does anyone want to ask any questions? I can. No, I didn't say that. No, I, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I, I was illustrating what happens when you heat up a glass; it becomes soft, and I think maybe that's what you were. But but you can you can actually put liquids into the hollow core if you want. You can you can, you can fill it. We do it afterwards. You just pump the liquid in. Anything you want. It could be vodka, <laughs> beer, I don't know, water. I mean, uh, methanol, typically water, methanol, other solvents. 
we, we, we do we do some experiments with chemists and then they, they often put different different solvents containing chemicals in there which are photoactivated for example so, yeah. Yeah, I Oh, one thing I was going to suggest was, was that, because um, I've been in this sort of thing several times, but quite a successful idea is if you write down, you're looking at the talk and you write down the question, something you're not sure about, write, write down a question, and, but don't, don't ask it right away, but think about it a bit. And once you've actually formulated the question right, then ask it. Yeah? So, so you can make a list of these things, and if we, if you have a, we have a kind of discussion session, then people have a chance to ask these questions. Uh, yeah, and that's that's that seems to work pretty. It has worked pretty well in the past for me, at least. So, so you need to write them down there because you forget them otherwise. Hello. Okay. Uh, I was wondering how was uh, the spatial spatial distribution of that mode that you put in the band gap, but in the with a higher frequency uh, in the when you draw the. Um, the dispersion of the light, yeah. the vacuum of the light, you have a band gap that appears to be, uh, the light appears to have a higher frequency than the one that you would expect at the beginning. Was it the beginning of the talk or? Yes, at the beginning, at the really beginning of the talk. Okay. You have the <clears throat> omega versus k. Let's just go back to the beginning. Yes, there, this and diagram? you have full photonic band gaps, and then you said you can have a mode uh, that has a higher frequency that uh, that is above the vacuum line. Yeah. How? Uh, what does it look like? Where is it? So was it maybe one of these? Was it maybe is this one? Yes, exactly. Yeah, this one here. Um, well, the frequency of the light is fixed here, so the frequency is fixed to this green line. And we, as we move, move across this diagram, we, and we, we, find, we can find a point here where the light, if, if, if you're in the, if you're, I mean, the, these fingers refer to the photonic crystal region, the, the periodic region, yeah? If you're not in the photonic crystal region, the finger doesn't apply. Then you end up with this black stuff behind. So we end, we, in, the, in the core, we're actually sitting in vacuum, which is this whole black region. Yeah? And then this yellow dot the, the, is, is in, a, in a position on the left-hand side, so it, the light is free to propagate in the hollow core, because it's, it's, uh, it's, the value of beta is smaller than the value of the vacuum wave vector. So it's able to propagate in the core at a slight angle. You know, it'll go at a slight angle with a small amount of momentum in this direction, and that small amount of momentum can create a mode for you. But, but uh, when we then, we just, we fix beta, fix beta is, is fixed across the, one of the things about these structures is that this value of beta is, is, is maintained right across the structure. It doesn't matter if you're in the hollow regions or the glass, it's a fundamental boundary condition that the component of wave vector will be maintained right across the structure. It's a constant. So beta is fixed, frequency of light is fixed, and the light is unable to propagate in the photonic crystal cladding, but it is able to propagate in the core. So then you have the perfect combination. It's trapped, and it's able to form a mode in the core, because in the core it's propagating. And, and creating a core mode, it involves interfering light traveling in several directions. Well, actually in all directions, because it's a Bessel function, basically. But, but uh, if, you, if light is propagating in, in opposite directions, you create a fringe. You know? And that fringe needs to fit inside the core. So, so if you like, we have to tune the angles between the rays so that the mode just fits in the core and, and, and all, everything comes together, we end up with a guided mode in the core. Does that help? Yes, but the speed of light in that one is uh, greater than the speed of light in vacuum. That's clear. The speed of light, which speed of light are we talking about? That one. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the speed of light in the core is, is, is faster, yes, because it's vacuum. The phase velocity of light is faster in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and of course, you, under normal circumstances, you can't guide light in vacuum. 
um, total internal reflection doesn't work. So that's where the Fatani Banga comes in. It, it allows you to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have a um, question related to the uh, making process. Uh, how do you uh, maintain the holes open? And uh -huh. Why do you have to do like in two steps? Can you? Is it, is it possible to make one step and uh, is there a limit to the number of holes that you can have on the structure? Oh, okay, so three questions. How do we, how do we maintain the holes open? Well, we use, um, you, you don't have to use pressure. You can, if you, if you get the con drawing conditions just right, as to say the temperature of the furnace and the, the speed at which you draw, those are the two parameters you've got to play with, yeah? the temperature of the furnace and the speed at which you draw. And if you've got low temperature furnace and you draw fast, you get very high tension. And that tends to maintain the structure well because the viscosity of the glass is, is, uh, is low. You know, so you, but they might break. You know, it's, it's, it breaks more easily when the tension is high. So there's all kinds of things you can play with. So it's possible to maintain the hollow channels, not perfectly. I mean, they, they will change in shape. There's going to be a consistent change in shape. They won't, they won't end up being nice and circular. They're going to look slightly distorted, maybe. But it will be a regular structure at the end. And it's highly reproducible. But the other trick is to apply pressure to individual holes. In, so when we're doing, when doing this process here, we, we can very easily connect little pipes to individual, individual capillaries and control the pressure independently. And you need a very fancy, expensive pressure control system that control pressures to millibar or less than a millibar levels, the differential pressure between the room and the actual, the actual fiber. So there's a large notice on the door saying, on a no kind to, is anyone to come in? You open the door, you change the pressure, and the fiber gets messed up, basically. So pressure is very important. That's how we keep them open. Or collapse them. Sometimes you want to collapse them. You might want to collapse uh, one of the holes for some reason, and then you just apply vacuum. That's how it works. And is there a limit to the number? Well, how patient you are, how big the preform is. I don't know. Usually there's no particular reason for making vast numbers. Most of the time we don't need to make a huge number of um, Apollo channels. There's one of my friends coming at me. My friends are mosquitoes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so anyone else? Yeah. Hi, uh, Prof. Jonathan. Uh, Pro, sorry, Prof. Uh, Philip Russell. Uh, I have a question about the generating the uh, supercontinuum uh, using Zeblan PCF. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you said about uh, you generating the UV ultraviolet. Yeah. Uh, and then the Zeblan has transparency until to six micron. Yeah. And and what happened to the the mid IR or IR region? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah. Thank you. We're not quite sure what's happening there. Um, I mean, what is certain is, is that, I, I think I mentioned this, but again, once, once again, I think Roy, Roy Taylor will talk about this, um, that because we're working with a dispersion profile, <clears throat> this blue dispersion profile, and we're pumping here, then um, you, we, we, we can generate uh, dispersive, what we call dispersive waves. Actually, I'm going to touch on these later, but, but not in this context. We can create dispersive waves here and disperse also ones at, at shorter wavelength. Um, uh, this is a way of transferring power to higher frequencies or indeed to lower, to lower frequencies. And we're not sure what's going on at the longer wavelength. I mean, it may just be that the core itself, I mean, it's a very, it's a very tiny core. And at some point, if you have a small core and you're, you're making the wavelength of the light longer, at some point the core stops guiding. It becomes very, very subject to bend loss. You know, it's no longer able to guide. There's a thing called the bend edge of fibers and you go to longer wavelengths. At some points, the fiber doesn't guide anymore. So I think that's probably the reason why we're not seeing, we're not seeing, seeing uh, uh, in, in, the, in the supercontinuum spectrum, we're not seeing much light on, uh, beyond about here, although it could also be the spectrometer that's not working so well. I mean, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but it's, for certain, the core is very tiny. I mean, this look, it's only one micron or so, and, and, and you would never expect a core that size to guide light of, say, three micron wavelength well. So I think that's the reason why it doesn't extend. Um, 
Besides the optical confinement there, the nonlinear refractive index is higher than silica? Um, it's about the same. Oh. It's about the same. Uh, but it has other advantages, this glass. Um, it's, it's better, it's a better, um, you, you can, you can um, dissolve rare earth ions better in the glass. So potentially make some quite nice amplifiers and so on. Um, yeah. Um, the, the main thing is this enormous transparency window that you've got. And it's, uh, yeah. So should I take another one? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, well, it's very hard to compete with the best telecoms fibers, uh, and in a way, that's not not that was not the object here. I mean, it, it, and these are these, of course, are not, are not optimized. I mean, we, uh, to be honest, we haven't studied the loss in great detail, partly because getting hold of the glass is, has proved quite difficult. Just getting hold of the raw material so we can make the fibers. So we've been a bit limited in, in what we can do, um, but. Um, I mean, in the experiments, if experiments like this, where you're where, you, where you're generating a supercontinuum, you don't need you don't need a long length of fiber. You just need a few centimeters, and the loss is is, is low enough so you, the loss here is insignificant over these very short lengths. Okay, but we're talking about the single most dense in the uh, Are you also only talking about the centimeters of length there? Or no, 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 no. I mean, so these other fibers, we've we've had holocore fibers that that guide over kilometers. Um, uh, uh, several kilometers, and and the best um, solid core silica photonic crystal fibers have lost. That's comparable with that of the best telecoms fibers, a little bit higher, but not much. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I have a couple of questions regarding this. One is, uh, did you guys look already at the uh, mode profile in the in the blue? Do you get to see any light? We've looked at that very carefully, actually. Yes. Uh, you mean this, this stuff in the blue, in the yeah. ultraviolet, and yeah. so on? Yeah. I mean, this this is one of the first things we looked at. We th we suspected it might be higher order modes, that some high were allowing ultraviolet light to be generated, but uh, we very carefully checked the experiment. There's no sign of any higher order modes. It's all in the fundamental. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, we've we've run extensive modeling on this as well, um, and have been unable to explain this ultraviolet, these ultraviolet bands. These these where are they? Oh, I've turned it off. Uh, there we go. The, the, these these curious bands that you see here in the, in, the, in the ultraviolet, we've been unable to explain these using the modeling. And I, actually, we don't know the the, the 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 properties of the material are just not known. It is there's there's no documented there's no documentation about the nonlinear coefficients of the glass in in the ultraviolet or indeed beyond that. So, so, so we don't know what to put into the modeling, basically. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's a new topic for research. <laughs> Gives us something to do. Mm -hmm. Okay.